This is Humpbacks from the Chilliwack. You'll see humpbacks from the Chilliwack on the mid coast passage. Uncover, discover, go on an adventure. Beautiful scenery, so natural and leisurely. You'll see humpbacks from the Chilliwack on the mid coast passage. You'll see Clem too, and the boardwalk on the mid coast passage. Kidasu, KK Sanda, Health Sook Nation, Ocean Falls, Namu, and Bella Coola. And you'll see humpbacks from the Chilliwack on the mid coast passage. And you can kayak from the Chilliwack on the mid coast passage. Kauai. Hakai, Elko Harbor, have a hot lunch, get a wet launch, and away you'll paddle. And you'll see humpbacks from the Chilliwack on the Mid Coast Passage. Yes, you'll see humpbacks from the Chilliwack on the Mid Coast Passage. So I was born in Salford, England and uh, we emigrated to Canada when I was uh, eight years old by ship, the Empress of Canada. My dad couldn't find a job in Vancouver, so eventually he was offered a job in Alert Bay, had no, no choice, had to take it. And uh, that was where I grew up in Alert Bay. I was just looking for a job and my friend uh, said, listen, you know, the ferry pays uh, over six dollars an hour and uh, that's twice minimum wage and uh, you know we're looking for people so uh, it was a bigger ferry that was coming on and uh, they promised me uh, full-time work which uh, which happened and so that was great so I uh, I applied for a job I was gonna do it for about a year but then 35 years later I retired. <laughs> uh, starting off as a deckhand, uh, later on coming to the Comox to Powell River run. Later on I put in for a job on the Central Coast as a junior officer and uh, worked uh, going from Port Hardy to Bella Coola and Ocean Falls, Clem, Clem too. And while I was there, we were given the opportunity to try different things, going to different places and entertaining the passengers so I was able to sing to them and have them sing with me. It was in the year of 96 in the harbor off Namu Old Captain Franson, his officers and crew, me boys, his officers and crew. With all that pomp and bluster behind us in the wash, the crew was feeling confident. Jolly tars the lot, me boys, jolly tars the lot. The opportunity was given to me when I was at BC Ferries. Uh, I asked if I could become a first aid trainer. <clears throat> and they said, go ahead, give it a try. And so I became a first aid trainer and they said, we'd like you to instruct dangerous goods as well. So I said, okay, I'll learn about that. And forklift. All right, so I learned about forklift. 
opportunities came up for training and I spent quite a bit of time training and that was uh, brought me to applying for North Island College when I retired. I instruct courses in domestic vessel safety, uh, radio, uh, small vessel operator proficiency. A is for Alpha, B is for Bravo, C is for Charlie as in Brown, D is for Delta, E is for Echo, F is a foxtrot in your arms. G is a game of golf, staying at a nice hotel in India. I met Juliet. We ate a kilo of lima beans, something that I'd like to forget. Mike is my friend, his birthday's in November. Oscar is my papa in Quebec. Romeo went to the Sierra Club to tango in his uniform with Victor. Whiskey is the next A, X it stands for X-ray, Yankee and Zulu are the end. So now you all can get it, it's the alphabet phonetic. Just learn this song, my friends. are my A1, ne'er mad a apple, you are the apple of my eye. You are a sun-ripened peach in a basket on the beach, underneath the clear blue Okanagan sky. You are a bright red Bing cherry hanging high up in a tree. Your apricots are ripe and they are waiting there for me. You are my A1, Naramata apple, and we'd sure make some fine apple pie. So uh, my grandfather is Charlie White, and uh, he is a well-known fisherman on the coast and has done uh, from everything from started Czech TV to uh, inventing the Scotty Downrigger, uh, as well as um, had his own fishing TV show uh, for 10 years, about 10 years. Yep. And then had a couple movies on the end of it and things like that as well, but he was definitely a prolific uh, fisherman on the on the coast. He, he wrote a whole bunch of books. On... I yeah, yeah, he literally wrote the, uh, the book on how to catch salmon. <laughs> uh, I uh, grew up uh, on the waterfront uh, on Lower Island and uh, my dad was a keen fisherman all his life. He grew up in Pittsburgh, so not much fishing there. So he moved to the West Coast and uh, worked for the Oregon Fish Commission. And then he got into TV. And so he moved, well, they, my mom and he came to Campbell River for their honeymoon so he could fish. And uh, then uh, he moved to Canada and started uh, Czech TV. And uh, then was a fishing guide. And then started the Undersea Gardens and Scotty Downrigger, a whole bunch of other. He was just a 
loved fishing and being around the water. And so he catered his career to doing what he loved. So by the time I could walk, he had me out fishing with him and driving the boat. And uh, so I was running a small boat when I was five and running the 36 foot family cruiser on my own when I was 12. And uh, just passion being on the beach and fishing and water skiing and playing around in the water. I really wanted to uh, figure out a way that I could uh, uh, get people to pay me for working on my own boat. And so that's where the wildlife charters and this boat came into effect. So I moved on to the Kumbaya when I was 22 hours old, under a day old. And uh, I lived on the boat until I was six years old, full time, and uh, then moved on to Quadra Island where I went to school in uh, elementary school in Quadra and uh, middle school, high school in Campbell River. Growing up fishing, I mean, for sure, was just every dock that we would dock beside growing up, I would jump off the boat and instantly try and fish for shiners. And like, you know, little perch basically about this big. And I would have a little tote or a bucket and make an aquarium and catch all these fish. And uh, that was definitely my, my first memory, my fishing experience for sure. The hard part was him sitting right here trying to do his work and dad there's a fish it's jumping right there come on and no 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 you know it's almost had to do your do your homework first then you can go fishing chain him to the table <laughs> yeah. remember the time in in kinkum that you uh it took till after dinner to get your homework done well yeah it's because there was a huge school of ulican in the back of the boat and uh there was like these halibut that were coming up from the bottom and like well you didn't find that out till late because it was dark he yeah, finally yeah, finished yeah. so we had the lights so, on in the back so of the boat. we turned on the big lights and then the oolikins came up and then all of a sudden the great big halibut comes up and he's Sits just on the like, surface goes, <laughs> sucks a bunch in and i'm like almost uh, jumping off the boat trying to you know to catch it yeah <laughs> Started working the boat and uh, do commercial type stuff in the in the winter. Um, researchers and, like I said, forestry engineers and silviculture, and and uh, then we do uh, wildlife charters and expedition fishing in the summer. We did a dozen years worth of uh, research with the Department of Fisheries, and so that was really cool because they paid us to go every coastal mile, every nook and cranny between oh, about 50 miles north of Bella Bella and Desolation Sound. And so it gave me a really intimate, intimate knowledge of the coast. And uh, then in all the different research contracts and forestry work, like I've probably lived a year up Butte Inlet with all the 10 day shifts we've done up there and same, not as much, but Night Inlet, Kinkham, Wakeman, Seymour, you know, Smith, Rivers, all the way up. So I've been fortunate enough to spend quite a bit of time in these remote coastal locations. Well, it was, um, it was just after we put the, uh, put the autopilot in the boat, right? You did the engine oh, hours yeah. of the boat and you figured you had hand steered the boat two and a half times around the world just on the BC coast. At this point, we've been using the boat for uh, remote accommodation purposes, uh, expedition fishing charters, um, Department of Fisheries and Oceans work. We've done, uh, used it for film shoots as well on different um, uh, productions as well. And, and going forward, I mean, especially as my dad is starting to get into retirement mode, it's more of a place for him to be able to continue to explore the coast in a less mental matter, maybe. <laughs> be able to do a bit more relaxed as well, but still to be able to, uh, you know, have our foot in, especially in the industry of, um, of uh, science on the coast and doing uh, 
uh, work for Department of Fisheries and Oceans, salmon enumeration work, uh, as well as uh, we could definitely see it using it more for film projects as well, to be able to host film crews in remote areas. But I mean, uh, it's, it kind of sees with, with, with what dad's doing, to be honest. Yeah, I think like he's, he's, he's training to, the way it's set up, it's set up like a small ship. And so it isn't like, oh yeah, here's the keys, off you go, right? No, it's, no, 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 but it, it's, it's, training of you know quite it takes weeks and well it's taking years of being there in certain situations and okay this is if this happens this is what you got to do and if that happens you know this is this is this is your boat and like i mean having running this boat to an extent is yes a dream of mine but at the same time like if i'm running the boat where where are you going to be you don't want to be sitting in campbell river you want to be out there running this boat so like oh no i'll let you run it i'll sit back here yeah, I know how squirrely you get sitting in town. So like, <laughs> oh yeah, no, I feel lost sometimes in town. It just well, feels exactly. like you're this, trapped, this, right? Yeah, as much as this is my home, this is this is you know this is our home kind of deal, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. We've had some pretty crazy days. We've had some crazy. I mean, I can think of. I mean, well, there's multiple days out there. We could think of one where we were coming by. This is my vivid memory of coming by Kelsey Bay. And again, we're talking about the the, the tides and the winds. And one of those days where Kelsey Bay can be a bad place weather-wise, and it was tied against it's like the Kate wind. Like Cape Mudge kind of thing, tied against the wind and the waves stack get... up. And uh, we were coming through and rock and roll. We're totally fine. But um, Dad had put a new. Uh, a new toolbox in the engine room and one of the doors wasn't latched properly on it. And so the door of the toolbox came flying open and a tape measure came flying across the engine room and severed the oil pressure line and uh, spewed oil everywhere through the engine room through a tiny little pinhole. And uh, obviously alarms went off up top here. We had to shut down I the engine. I started losing oil pressure and that engine is married to the boat. And uh, it's a the the engine the boat is 1975 the engine is 1949 but it is the most dependable quiet fuel efficient engine that you would ever want to have right it's a, so i shut it down and uh and it was uh kai and i and his mom and uh, we were we'd been working and living on the boat for a long time nobody panics or anything i'm I'm running back, we got Kai on the wheel. Yeah, I was on the wheel. Because there's no autopilot to keep the boat going. We don't want to be broadside in those waves. And without power, we're kind of gliding to a stop. And so uh, Leanne pulls in the Zodiac. I jump in the Zodiac and I was getting the engine started. She's running up, setting up a tow line on the bow. And then I run up there and before the boat even slowed down to get sideways, I was towing it with the Zodiac and, and uh, Getting it, getting it into Kelsey Bay. We did have a uh, uh, fish farm crew boat come and tow us the rest of the way in. And then we cleaned up the mess, figured out what was going on. And then just as we were leaving Kelsey Bay, a fish boat broke down in the same area. And so we went out and towed him in. We used to use this boat as uh, a research vessel, for, research vessel for Department of Fisheries and Oceans, uh, doing salmon enumeration work and coho fry surveys up and down the coast. So for years, we had our kind of finger on the pulse of what the, um, uh, of what the fisheries were doing up and down the coast in these mainland inlets. Um, that, we used to do that contract for how many years? It was probably- A dozen years. About a dozen years until they ran out of funding in the mid 2000s. And, uh, so in recent years, we have been doing, uh, we started a, a wild salmon count, and so we've just been up in areas in Seymour Inlet and a couple of these other uh, remote uh, mainland inlets. We've been doing, co um, just been doing. Enumeration work where we snorkel and wade and yeah. count the fish. We have all the equipment from when we work for fisheries. And so, uh, and we're up in those areas anyway. They have all kinds of people on the island. Anywhere you can drive to, they have people that can do creeks like that. But it's the remote stuff that that's, you know, 90% uh, of the battle is actually getting 
there with the equipment and the people that know how to do it, right? So. Yeah, and that, that is a, for, for future fisheries, understanding what the habitat is, is the number one thing preserving salmon going forward, uh, is habitat, habitat, habitat. Especially back in the day when we were, you know, dad's talking about, you know, back when Charlie and him used to fish for Brazilian, the mentality always was, was, you know, keep the biggest fish you possibly could. And uh, over those years, the, has affected the gene pool. And so when you genetically select out the bigger fish constantly, you're going to have a, uh, a smaller breed of fish. And so to be able to release large fish and keep those genetics back in the system, it's a, uh, it's a good way to keep, basically preserve those, gen those rare genetics. And that, that is probably one of my biggest fears, to be honest, is what will happen in the future on this coast in terms of fisheries. Uh, just even thinking that uh, the next generation won't be able to experience uh, the fishing and uh, plentifulness of the ocean that we have been so fortunate to have been a part of for these many years may not happen in a decade's time is terrifying. And uh, so to be able to be as part as much as possible, to be able to help with as simple, like just as, as we do the salmon enumeration work, as well as anything we can to be able to help preserve and understand the natural environment better. Um, because it's, it's not something that we can look 10 years down the road and be like, oh yeah, we'll do it then. No, it's, it's gotta be done now. The, and also just to be able to eat, be able to go into those different river systems up and down the coast and being able to understand what the returns are each year going forward will help um, fisheries determine what the allocated fishery is going to be for recreational and commercial fisheries. So understanding how well the runs are doing is vital for uh, understanding. Well, and we've actually been noticing, uh, especially with coho, that uh, they're skinnier. They're not, the, the average weight has dropped and it's probably an ocean survival issue it's interesting covid the first year of covid some of the best fishing we've had in 20 years yep fishing lodges were all closed or most of them were closed um commercial fisheries were commercial fisheries were cut way back because there was no market anymore um, with the restaurants being closed it was very noticeable and then mother nature's way of kind of trying to do something about what's happening with the climate.